Open up your Bibles to Daniel. Open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Uh, thank you so much for what we already heard tonight. And I want to just preach the word out of Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to go to a few other places that I might cite. And the worship team, you guys can come on up in maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Put a timer on me, worship team, 15 or 20 minutes, and please come on up. And we're going to worship God. Daniel chapter 3. Uh, we've heard a lot of messages on this uh, place in the Bible. It's one of my, I think for a lot of us, it's our, one of our favorite places. Uh, we were just singing about it tonight. Uh, it's the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar makes. Then he gathers a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Tell your neighbor, a lot of people. A lot more than are, that are here. A lot of people to worship this statue that he made. Uh, you know, before I read anything out of this text, every generation will be challenged in some way when it comes to idol worship. Every time we are presented the opportunity to worship God, Satan will always present an opportunity to worship an idol. Now, believe it or not, songs can become idols. Stages can become idols. Microphones can become idols. Gifts can become idols. Talents can become idols. Worship teams can become idols. Because idol worship is not just the making of a statue. It's anything that in the slightest way possible can get your attention off the one whom deserves your worship. It's not just making a gold cow. It's not just making a big statue. It's not just making a big, a big uh, you know, I'm about to say a big lady. I don't know why, why I was going to say that. That's just, hello. <laughs> an animal or whatever. It's not just the making of an image. It's just taking your attention slightly off the one that deserves and only is worthy of your worship. It's interesting when Jesus was filled or the Bible says the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. It says right after that that he was driven by the Holy Spirit. One text will say he was led by the Holy Spirit. Another text will say he was driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And it's interesting, he was driven into the wilderness not for vacation. The Bible says he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Are we here? When the Holy Spirit came upon him, it led him to a place where he had to endure testing. I don't know about you, but I have found in my life that when I begin to encounter the person of the Holy Spirit, when I begin to encounter the presence of God in a greater way, when I begin to understand what worship really is, when I start getting deeper in the Word of God, when I start devoting more time to prayer in my life, there are things that begin to come against me almost immediately. Because when you have something that begins to take you somewhere you have not been, there is something there that is waiting for you to take what you have. The Holy Spirit came upon him and began to lead him into the wilderness and Satan began to tempt him for 40 days. And it's interesting that at the end of this temptation, Satan wanted his worship. The one from whom idol worship began now wants to be worshiped. See, Satan's history was 
very much to do with worship. And the, the moment that he wanted worship, an idol was created. Because idol starts with I. It doesn't start with an image being made. Idol starts with I. When I, in my heart, want something for myself, an idol can be made. Generation, are you, are you listening? Because if we're learning about worship, we need to learn about idols. Because when God presents us opportunity to get into a new place of worship, Satan will pre present a new opportunity for idol worship. In every generation that begins to go to the mountain to worship God, there was someone at the foot of this mountain making an idol. It's interesting that Israel, when they did not want to go to the mountain to present themselves, they made an idol. Because if you don't present yourself in worship, you'll make yourself something so that you don't have to go there. Are you not happy that we're talking about idols? Idol worship begins with I. When I is in the front of the worship, when it's more convenient for me, when it's more comfortable for me, when I think this or I think that, or my opinion says this or my comfort says this, when I is at the beginning of worship, an idol, idol is being made. They said, Moses, you go. You go to the mountain because when, they, when he was on that mountain and it began to shake and it began to rumble and lightning began to strike and they began to be afraid because this God is actually real and he deserves to be worshipped and you need to present yourself properly that you can worship him. They said, Moses, you go and we're going to stay here. And when they stayed there and he went, they began to make an idol. Because worship was not, is not just intended for, for you to lift your hands and lift your voice. Proper worship is the offering of yourself. If you're not ready to offer yourself to God, you're not quite yet worshiping. And I believe, I believe God doesn't require us just to lay everything down in one moment. I don't think that's possible. I think God leads us through stages where we begin to lay more and more down. Or maybe in the season that I'm at, I lay what I can. And as he begins to lead me farther, I lay more of what I can. God doesn't demand me to lay my life down in this moment. He, de he, 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 he demands that I lay what I can from my life down in this moment. Are you here? L hear me right. Laying your life down is right. It's in the Bible. But I believe there are segments to you laying your life down. There are processes to you laying your life down. There are seasons to you laying your life down. If you're not willing to lay your life down, you're not willing to worship. Because your worship is not just your words and your hands. Your worship is your heart. Your worship is your identity. Your worship is your life. Your worship is your body. Your worship is your soul. Your worship is your mind. Laying down before God, giving him the worship that he's worthy of. And if worship is anything less than that, and if worship is more about I than him, it becomes an idol. This is really serious because we maybe ignore texts in the Old Testament, but Jesus didn't ignore them. In fact, Jesus quoted them. He quoted Deuteronomy when he was facing the devil. He said, do not worship anyone except the Lord your God. I must worship the Lord my God and no one else can I worship. Are you here? Jesus quotes this text when he is offered by Satan things for himself. I'm starting with this because in this story of Daniel, I think it's really relevant to the, to the place that we're at right now in history. Maybe there even isn't such a big problem with the way we do worship as much as what is it that we're worshiping? Who is it that we're worshiping? And is there idol worship in our life? Because idol worship in your life, I know Vlad was just in Indonesia telling me about all the idols he saw. He told me everywhere you went, there's an idol. Idol in people's front yards, idol in people's backyards, idols on the mountain, idols on the street, idols everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there's idols. Idols in America are just a little bit more invisible. 
There can be an idol right in my room. There can be an idol right in my phone. There can be an idol right in my notebook. There can be an idol on my clothes. There can be an idol on my social media. There can be an idol in my heart. There can be an idol in my mind. There can be an idol tomorrow, even though tonight I worshiped God. What guarantees that she won't bow to an idol? What guarantees that she won't be misled to worship an idol? What makes you so special? What set apart these three young men in the crowd of thousands to not bow but stand in that moment? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which, Neb which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And so, lists all these off again. All of these people gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image. And then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, people, every nation, language, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, all these instruments, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, drums, piano, guitar, all kinds of music, all the people, all the nations, all languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They, did not, they do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. What I want to talk just a little bit more about before we get back into worship. is our private life. And this is not just the time that you spend in prayer, the time that you spend in the word. I think it's safe to say most of us, I think most of us, spend a lot of time with ourselves and maybe more time with ourselves than other people. If you, I don't know if you room with somebody or if you are, you know, got your, got your brother or your sister in your room. But for the most part, you sleep by yourself. Sometimes if, you, if, you're, if you're an early bird and you got to get up and get, get to work on time, you get up by yourself. You drive in the car by yourself. You get to work maybe there with, with other people if you're working with other people or going to school. You're driving home again by yourself, maybe in your room by yourself. You, you spend a lot of time by yourself. And what I have found and I think we know this in the Bible, is there, there are things that happen in our private life that only God sees. But the things that do happen in our private life result to how we live our public life. You know, some people say you can hide it from people. I, not, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. You can hide some things from people, but in due time, what you are hiding will be revealed. Are you here? 
So like you can hide it, yeah, for a season, you can hide it for a year, you can hide it for a few if you're really good. But sooner or later, because it's the Bible, it says everything that is hidden shall come to the light eventually. Now I'm reminded of a story of David when he was fighting the bear and the lion. Now we, we love the story of Goliath, but I wish I had some more detail on the story of the lion and the bear. Are you here? Like, I get, I, get you, I get you killing the giant. Like, you had a rock, and Max, are you playing piano? Oh, I thought Max was coming up to play piano. Max, please, please play the keys, Max. <laughs> Just pretend like you know what you're doing on that camera, but we know you play keys secretly in your room. Um, it will be revealed, <laughs> brother. It will be revealed. You know, he threw the stone. We know the story. Boom, giant was slain, hit him right in the head. We got a lot of sermons we do on that. It was powerful. But I, I want to know more about that lion and that bear. Or different characters in the Bible. Like, I, I would like to, I already mentioned this, but I would like to know what Jesus was actually facing, not just on the last day of his fast there in the wilderness, but what he was facing for all the 40 days. But all we know is that what happened in those private moments played a role in the public moments of their life. Are you here? We're, we're, I know, it. This is, we're just slowly getting there. What happened in the secret place led to what happened in the public place. I don't know where we got this from. I don't know where we got this kind of doctrine. But man does not promote you in the kingdom of God. God promotes you in the kingdom of God. If God has seen you faithful in little, the Bible says God will be giving you more because what you are faithful in, he now trusts you to take on some more responsibility. It's not man that promotes you to a new level in your life. It's God who promotes you. And my friend, if man is promoting you, I'd be worried. Are you ready for the promotion? Because if God ain't opening the door, I probably wouldn't walk through it. I'm talking about idols. I'm talking about promotion. What is this about tonight, man? Phil, what you doing messing everything up? Get on the drums, bro. Let's make it right. Yeah. Let's go. I'm serious. Let's do it, bro. You and me. This is, we're about to release a new signal, uh, signal, um, single. Is that what you call it? Is you call it a signal or you call it a single? Um, so I, I'm redefining the term. We are coming out with a new signal <laughs> because when this signal flashes, it's going to, no, I'm just kidding. I think we misinterpret with our human eyes often what promotion looks like. See, Joseph's faithfulness unto God led him not to be in the highest place of Egypt. It first led him to be in the prison of Egypt. You see, David's slaying of a lion and a, and a bear did not lead him to slaying giants, did not lead him to the throne. The slaying of a giant, the slaying of the bear and lion, it led him back to the wilderness with the sheep. The slaying of a giant led him to the place of hiding in caves. I think there's something that with the eyes of men we cannot see, that when a person is walking faithfully before his God, that sometimes what looks like to us a storm and a mess and a tribulation in a person's life can be actually what's preparing him for the next thing that God has for his life. last seasons, I have found myself to be facing more opposition. Ilya, are you recording this signal? Yeah? Put that phone down, bro. This can't be broadcasted anywhere. I will confiscate your phone. He, he's doing, doing one of these. He's recording right here. I'm like, you, stu you think I'm stupid? I can see your phone like I can see your soul right now, brother.
what is this guy doing? That's not part of the signal, bro. That's not part of the signal. Keep it real. Let's do this. These three men, three young men. This is, this is crazy. Three young men. Three young men. Three young men. Ain't no worship leader done that before. <laughs> I'll teach you later. Three young men are standing among a great crowd. Kind of like Phil is with his buddy in a great crowd surrounded by bars. We'll talk to him about that later. Uh, surrounded by a great crowd. And this, you know, this is, this is so heroic and so powerful and you can just envision yourself being there. And as everybody begins to bow, they just stand. You know, like, this is my moment, you know. This is what I live for. This is my moment right here, my promotion. The warning was if you don't bow to worship, you'll be in the furnace. This wasn't what they were told when they faced Nebuchadnezzar. This is what they were told before they had to bow. If you bow, if you choose not to bow, the furnace is waiting for you. You know what I think? I think there are furnaces that have been pre 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 prepared for you in your life when you choose not to bow. I think there's valleys you will have to face just you and the sheep when you choose not to bow. I believe there are prisons that are waiting for you when you choose not to bow because following Jesus ain't that easy because it costs you your life. There are things and there are people and there's an adversary who is not welcome to you and not happy about you following Jesus. And when you choose not to bow, there are things that you begin to have to go through. But as, as we sung, the fire will not burn you and that wall, it will come down. But are you being faithful in the place that no man sees? But God is watching. Your problem is not the lack of boldness you have to lift your face or your hands as you are here. Your problem is how you're living outside of these walls. They did not bow their knees because their knees got used to bowing to someone else. They did not bow their heads as everybody else did to this statue. Their heads got used to bowing to someone else. As they heard the magistrate begin to say, if you don't bow, you will be thrown into the furnace. But see, they got used to hearing the actual voice, the voice that doesn't instill fear, but gives you strength. The voice that doesn't harm you and put you in a corner, but begins to strengthen you and lift you up. They got used to hearing a different voice. And so when they began to hear the voice that was filled with fear, if you don't bow, to worship the furnace is waiting for you but there was no fear in these young men's heart it wasn't because they were stronger or buffer or smarter it wasn't because of their good looks or their nice clothes there was something that set them apart from the crowd because there was some way they were living differently than everybody else see the public place just revealed the private place of everyone's life but that public place revealed these three men's private life because the Bible says, he who seeks me in the secret place and the Father sees what you do in secret will promote you publicly. See, the public promotion was not their earning, it was his reward. The Father says, I will reward those that do what they need to do 
in the private place. See, the standing of these young men was the reward of the Father. Not their great strength and great courage, though they had it. It was the reward from the Father to be able to stand amidst a crowd that was bowing. How about amidst a generation? How about amidst a world that is all bowing to the same thing? Every idol revolves around self. True worship, even if it has to face death, revolves around him, not me. When I comes first in any part of my life, be careful, you might be building an idol. What I think is better, what I think I should do, what I think is the right thing, what I think, where I, where I think I should go, what I think I should be doing with my life, what I think the Bible says, what I think is more convenient, what I think is more comfortable. I don't care what other people are saying, what I think, what I think, and when I comes first, This is how you're ready. This is how you know you're ready, I should say. This is how you know you're ready for whatever God has for you next. You don't want to go there anymore. You know what's crazy about this story? Rado was preaching on this story, I think, a little over a month ago, maybe close to two months ago, the first service. And as he was preaching, something that just stood out to me, that I just kept giving time to think to, related to my personal life. When they were thrown into the, fi- the furnace that was heated seven times hotter, and we know that Nebuchadnezzar says, it's, we don't know how, he's looking into the fire, and he sees three plus one and he's like didn't we throw in three and you know all the geniuses that are surround the king y- yes sir you threw in three but I see the three and one that looks like the son of God and they are all loosed and walking in the fire And I don't know, I don't know how long he was looking. But what I, what God showed me, they remain there. And the reason they did not remain there is because they were called out of where they were. See, we cannot fear the opposition that will come against your life. We cannot fear the bad day that might come. We cannot fear what people will think about you or what your parents will think about you or what someone will say about you or people's opinions about you. Forget about your eye if you're really serious about worshiping God. Because when you're serious about worshiping God, this is what will happen. Everything will come against your eye and you will have to lay your eye down in the fire. But the only reason they were worthy to lay themselves down in the fire is because when no one saw, they were laying themselves down before God. I don't want to be fooled. Like we heard, be be hyped up, be be pumped up about worshiping God, but then when opposition begins to come in my life, I so quickly begin to take a knee. True worship is connected to servanthood because when these men came to King Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we will not serve your idol nor serve you and worship this thing because who you serve has everything to do with who you worship. See, it's not enough just to lift the hands and lift the voices. What defines our worship, 
what puts content into our worship is whom we serve idols are unproportional see it was 60 cubits tall and only six cubits wide that's a really weird size because it will demand less of you but promise you things that you will never have idols will only cheap you out of what God actually has for you idols will only present a back door but that back door is a trap to your life see idols are not proportional because what you need to lay down is equivalent to what you will receive he who sows will, the, will, will reap the same thing who will get he who gives will begin to see the same fruits in his life God is not a man that you could fool him and he is the same in Deuteronomy. He is the same in Leviticus. He is the same in the book of Moses. There's no book of Moses. He is the same. He's the same. And we cannot worship any other God other than him. I think we might be getting close to an idol. When we hear people say, when we hear it said from the pulpit, when we hear it said on YouTube, that it does not matter how you live your private life, that it does not matter what you do or do not do, it matters what you do and do not do. You cannot earn your righteousness, but your works speak of your righteousness. My friend, if you're washed by the blood, you walk a different way, you live a different way, you talk a different way. No, you can't earn it, but my friend, you will display it because righteousness that I've been covered by is not just some cute mouthwash or some cute, ba you know, the, 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 the bath bombs and now I smell better. It changes who I am. It changes my identity. It changes my mindset. It changes my heart. It changes me from within. I'm a new man and the old man is gone. Righteousness will be displayed by the way that you live your life. The only thing that will guarantee that you do not bow when everyone bows is that you do not bow in your personal life. You do not bow in your room. You do not bow in your closet. You do not bow in the car or in your workplace to anything except God. Fear no evil, for he is with you. Do not fear the shadow of death. Do not fear the opposition. Do not fear being singled out. Do not fear standing alone. Do not fear walking through the water. Do not fear walking through tests. My friend, the test is just God preparing you because he wants to make sure that when everyone begins to bow, that you, my friend, would stand. When everyone is afraid, that you would not be afraid. When everyone is hopeless, that you would have hope. When everyone does not know what to do, that there would be faith. When no one knows what to say, there would be the Word burning in your heart. When the way is not clear, but the Holy Spirit is leading you, do not bow to anything except God. Do not bow, no matter what bear you face, no matter what line you face, no matter what woman is trying to tempt you, do not bow because he's watching. And the test that you overcome will guarantee when everyone begins to bow, you will stand. And we need people right now more than ever before to stand, to stand and not be afraid, to stand and not be, to not doubt, to not look to see what everyone else is doing. You must decide before you look at what everyone else is doing, what you will do. Because to look around at the crowd is too late. You need to make your decision now. Because in the crowd, it's too late. You're gonna look around and when everyone bows, you will also bow. But when your decision is made that no one saw, that you gave to God, that you presented yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, because this is your true way of worship. When you do that, you will stand in the public place and you will not bow. You will stand in your school place and you will not bow. You will stand in the workplace and you will not bow. You will stand in 
the city hall. You will stand in the school stadium. You will stand in the courtyards of your industry, but she will not bow. Because you worship no idol. You worship the true, one and only, living God. No thing made by man, no thing that Satan presents to me, no glory of this earth will take my knee, will take my heart, will take my voice. I will only serve the Lord my God and I will worship Him as well. This moment right now is for you to choose. Because you're presented this choice every day and I must remind you in the name of our God that you must choose whom you will serve. If you wanna serve yourself, you've, become, you've begun the construction of your new idol. If you want to live for yourself, it's already in the mold. If you want to do what you want to do, my friend, it's probably already been set up in your room. But God is calling us to serve Him and serve Him only. That's not just what happens here. This is just a reflection of what's supposed to happen our, our, our entire week, Monday through Saturday. God desires that you would serve Him. Serve Him when no one sees. Serve Him when no one is watching. Don't fool yourself. Don't lie to yourself. And my friend, do not let Satan, do not let Satan deceive you. Because your worship unto God is not just what happens here in this moment. Your worship unto God is what happens tomorrow when you wake up and whom you choose to serve. If you've been shaky in your private life, you know someone here right now is being condemned, not by my voice, but being condemned by their own thoughts and conscience and their, even Satan in this moment is condemning you because of secret sins that are in your life. But see, what gives us boldness to approach the throne of grace is not that we have overcome everything in this moment, it's that we don't hide anything in this moment. What gives me boldness to come and lift my hands and bow my knees unto Him is not that my life this week went by perfect. It's that I choose not to stay there. I choose not to hide anything. I choose not to fake this out, not to pretend like everything is going good. I choose to be real with myself and real with God. And this gives me boldness because what I present to my God and I say, Lord, this is what I'm going through. This is everything that's going wrong. And I, I give it to him. My friend, the Bible says, when you come into the light and you say what's happening in your life, the blood of Jesus has power to cleanse you. I'm not going to let you leave with condemnation. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to leave with condemnation. Because when you are going through a mess in your life and no one sees but you know and you can't hide it because eventually it comes out and you get nervous, you don't have boldness to worship, you don't have boldness to pray, you, 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 you keep thinking about everything you need to fix. But see, boldness is not because you lived perfectly this week. Boldness is because you walk openly before your God. There was something in my life that kept bothering me even as I got married. And I'm sharing to you breakthrough that I received. Because as, as I sat with one of our leaders in our church, I'm like, I know, I'm like, hey, I'm not struggling in this area, but it does bother me. 
because I feel like it keeps following me in certain places of my life. And he told me, what you open to God, no matter what it is, you will find strength that he begins to give you because you will know he knows and he'll take care of me. See, why you lack strength is not because God can't deal with what you're going through. It's because you're not giving it to him. Why the hands can't go up, it's not because you can't worship. Don't let the, uh, don't let the enemy deceive you that you are not worthy to worship. Ain't nobody here worthy to worship. My friend, the one thing that we did already disqualified us from being worthy to worship. He is worthy and his blood made me worthy. His blood that was shed made a public spectacle triumphing over the enemy. Everything that I might be facing in my private life, Jesus made public. public. So what do I need to do? Whatever I'm privately going through, make public with God. Open it up to God. Say, God, I need help in this area. And watch how boldness begins to come to walk out of where you are. Remind yourself and remind God, Father, I'm not staying here. I want you to lead me farther. When you pray dangerous prayers like this, you're going to run into a test very soon. And when you run into that test, trust God in that test. Don't fear what the enemy is putting out at you. Listen, that furnace got seven times hotter, but it still didn't do nothing to them. It killed the people that were throwing them in. But when they were there, it says when they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. But you know what was left in the fire? The ropes that they came in there with. Because when the enemy turns the fire up, what God is doing is he's just gonna remove the ropes even quicker. When, when the enemy begins to come against you with some, uh, uh, some crazy stuff that's gonna start, you start getting afraid, you, you're, you're afraid to go out somewhere, you're afraid that God, someone's gonna take your life, crazy things running through your mind because you're drawing closer to God. And when the fire gets hotter, those ropes, ropes will burn quicker. They're gonna fall off right away as you endure. And listen, in that moment, you're not gonna be wanting a promotion anymore because the Lord will be walking with you in the fire and somebody else will be calling you out. Hey, come out of the fire. You, you got through the test. You are ready for the next thing. Promotion ain't for us to focus on. His presence is what we focus on. Because when you're in His presence, you don't care about promotion. If you care about promotion, you're not in His presence enough. When you're in His presence enough, Promotion is the last thing you care about and you're going to stay there in that fire because he's there and he's doing something that only he can do in that fire. And I got good news for anybody that's still going through that fire. Three men came out, but one stayed there and he's always there for you no matter when you come into it. I want to call those to stand. They need to make a decision today to serve the Lord, their God, and worship Him only. Please do not look around because you will see that when you look around, you'll be slower to stand. Make a decision before anybody else stands in this moment. When we begin to worship God right now, we begin to pray. I want you to make a decision in your heart to stand that you standing will continue to stand in your personal life. Continue to stand when no one's watching. Stand when you are being tempted. Stand when you are being tested. Stand when you are being persecuted. My friend, you have to get through the test because there's things God is gonna lead us into. There's gonna be persecution that we get led into. There's things that God is gonna prepare us for in this season and you need to be ready for it. As we begin to hear the sound pick up, I want you to stand. We're not bowing to the enemy. We're not bowing to fear. We're not bowing to suicidal thoughts. We're not bowing to porn addiction. We're not bowing to lust or anger. 
We're not bowing to offers that this world might give us. We're not bowing to the enemy. We're not bowing to live for ourselves. We're not bowing for any gold statue or anything this world might offer us. But we're standing, standing for God. We're standing, serving Him and serving Him only. Choose this day whom you will serve. Now, I want to call you forward to step into the fire. If there are things, if there are ropes, if there are things that have been coming around your life and tangling you in your life, the Bible says that sin so easily entangles us and we must throw it off. If there are things that have been entangling you, if there are things that are private, but in this moment you want to make it public and say, God, this area I'm not hiding. This area I'm giving to you. I want you to give me victory in this area. I want you to burn my ropes and break my chains. I want this world to come down. I need this sea to split. Whatever it is that you're facing, I want you to come forward to the fire and trust the Lord in this moment as he meets you here to deal with those ropes, to break every chain, to break every wall, to split every seed. He is faithful. He is faithful and he is here. Any person here, Lord, that has still not responded but, be, but is being demonically oppressed, I pray freedom to those that are oppressed right now in the name of Jesus, that every spiritual oppression in their life would break off right now in the name of Jesus. We call the blood of the Lamb over every individual, over every curse, over every demonic oppression. And we ask you, Father, that you would break it in the name of your Son, Jesus, that people this, this evening today would walk out free, would walk out free, would walk out free. Shut up, my son, to that Baba Bakiri Bokutu Dumba. Shut up, my son, to that Baba Bakiri Bokutu Dumba.